this is the arena of Ireland. Um, we also are in an arena a little bit similar to that of, uh, of Nîmes. Um, but here the energy is slightly less changed uh, than it was in, uh, uh, in Nîmes. If you uh, look at the more recent times, of course, there have been other things going on here, other things happening here. But they are much more in line with uh, what was here before in, uh, in Roman times. So the place of the arena, is, it's not actually a temple, but it is a person where people are also focusing on the same archetype. The archetype of the, of the warrior and of the qualities of the warrior. Skill, bravery, strength, uh, strategy, tactics, and um, so this place is very much connected to the to the god Mars, Ares, as it was called in, uh, uh, in Greek. And Ares is also seen as the uh, as the symbol of masculinity, uh, while Venus is seen as the symbol of femininity. And the masculine is seen as uh, being very uh, dominant, the deciding factor who changes the world, transforms the world into what he wills it to be. So he starts to transform his own emotions, his own feelings, uh, his own body through the application of, uh, of martial discipline. And by uh, so first, there's the process of reshaping yourself to turn yourself into like the ultimate man, the ultimate Mars. And then after you've done that, you can to start to reshape the other things around you. Um, so it's very much also in warfare about putting your, the things which are hard in you, which are perfected in you, against the soft spot of the other person. And this is the strategic part. So you look for not so much the male clashing with the male, but you look for what are the soft spots, what are the weak spots, the feminine energies, where you can yeah, move in with your blow or with your strike or with your elbow or with your fist. And of course, everybody has weak spots, everybody has, has soft spots. And working with the Mars energy is also about learning not just to work with your masculine side, but also how to play with your feminine side. Because the feminine side should respond to your masculine side. If you have a weakness, then if you apply your masculine power, you can turn that weakness into strength. And uh, this technique, because there's always a limited amount of attention, a limited amount of focus. So there's always parts of you which escape your attention, which are your shadow, which are in your blind spot. And by moving your blind spot around, <coughs> slowly but surely you start to, yeah, to work on all sides of you. And the people who are you know, attacking you are also your teachers. Uh, because they are showing you what are your blind spots, what are the places you can't see, what are the places you can't reach yet. And by fighting and continuing your, your struggles, slowly but surely you become more aware of yourself and every part of yourself becomes improved. And slowly but surely you also increase your level of skill, your level of awareness. And it's also very important to, to realize that, that fighting wasn't just about uh, skill, it was really a path of development. So in the uh, Japanese martial arts, you also have this distinction. You have the jitsus and the dos. So we have judo, karate do, and ninjitsu, jujitsu. And the jitsus are about physical skill. So they're very much about like, how do I disarm the person? How do I kill the person? How do I deflect the blow? And it is only a skill on a physical level. Well, the dos often uh, includes uh, uh, energy work, uh, meditation, um, to not just to develop the body, but also to develop both energy and body in the same way and in equal manner, so that they are in harmony. Because the danger is, of course, if you develop a jitsu, then it becomes very easy for you to kill somebody, but if you haven't really worked on dealing with your aggression, dealing with your emotions, you might accidentally kill somebody, or your power might not be under your control. And especially in arenas, it was much more about controlling your power. It's not about killing the other person. 
because if you walk into the arena, you stab a dagger in his eye and he's dead and three seconds later, then nobody yeah, likes it. <laughs> Nobody's impressed by it, nobody is entertained by it. Uh, so it's very much uh, like a chess game. So every uh, person knows, because most of the gladiators, they train together, they know each other. Um, so they know a little bit about each other, they know each other's weaknesses, they know each other's strategies. So it's often more like a chess game. Well, if I do that, I force him to raise his shield to protect against my blow, and if he raises his shield, I can dive under. And <laughs> so it was not just about physical strength and brutally hammering into each other. It was also very much about strategy, about tactics, and about knowing both yourself, your capabilities and your weaknesses, and understanding also the strengths and the weaknesses of the other person. And this is also where the feminine comes into play. Um, because just as you can strike, which is basically the Mars force, you're putting your strength against their other weak spot. Uh, you can also use your feminine power by, in a way, uh, using the movement of the other. If the other wants to stab you, you're extending their arm. Okay, thank you for that arm. I can take that and twist it and do something with it. So you're in a way using uh, uh, yeah, the movement of the other. And this is more the feminine. So you roll with the blow, you move with the other, and then uh, this turns again into, into strength. So in karate, this is very much called the, the, the water and stone style. So you have to alternate being like a stone, being strong, uh, being forceful, being stable, with water, with flowing, moving aside, dodging, moving back and forth. And by combining these two strategies, uh, you become a harmonized person who uses both their feminine aspects and their masculine aspects. And only by, in a way, integrating these two aspects of your nature um, can you truly really become uh, yeah, a great warrior or a great gladiator? Um, also for uh, professional gladiators, they often served a dual purpose. Um, because on the one side they were entertainers here in the arena, um, but on the other side they were also entertainers for rich women. <laughs> <laughs> I because you know, yeah, women, of course, are looking for yeah, young boys. Yeah, <laughs> good, uh, good, yeah, genes basically to create a strong child which will survive, which will have good qualities. So often the women would also come here to watch all the men to see, like, okay, what would be an interesting father <laughs> to father a child with me. <laughs> And it would then, yeah, basically, yeah, hire the gladiator to uh, well, come to their bedchambers. <laughs> so it was very much uh, also the dual nature of the gladiator. One, they have to be strong and show that they're better than other men. But on the other hand, they have to be, yeah, lovers and <laughs> entertain the women. And that's also the other part of the business. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, both these energies are still quite present here, if you go into, uh, into the older layer. Um, also, the, the gladiators, they often were relatively religious people, because, well, if you're going out into the arena, um, usually most combats were uh, yeah, basically non-lethal. They were against, uh, yeah, uh, until one person submitted, or until first blood, or could not fight any longer. <laughs> And then, depending on the public, uh, they would decide whether the person should live or die. Uh, deaths were relatively uh, uncommon, uh, because it takes a lot of time to train a person to be a good gladiator. That's years of work and effort and food and money and things which have to be spent in the person. If they only last for one afternoon, it's kind of a waste. <laughs> so often people had quite long careers of 10 or 20 years as gladiators. And um, this, uh, the careers were sometimes more voluntary, sometimes less voluntary. So what, um, what happened often in the Roman conquests, just like in the Greek conquest, that the people who were conquered, they would become the slaves of the conquerors. 
and slaves can be put to different uses. So usually, well, if the person is relatively weak, but they have a good mind, they become house slaves, they read poetry, they, they make notes, they do the bookkeeping, uh, they clean the house, things like this. If they're a little bit more healthy, uh, then you often would put them to work on the fields, um, taking care of the corn and things like that. Uh, but sometimes you also had uh, yeah, people who were soldiers or, or in a way also it was really dangerous to keep as well as slaves. <laughs> um, also, slaves had quite a good legal protection in the Roman system. So you couldn't just kill a slave or beat a slave or torture a slave or things like that. Uh, so it was a lot more uh, civilized than slavery was in the Americas. Um, but uh, yeah, these other slaves, they were often uh, given the option of either to join the army as auxiliaries or indeed to yeah, go for uh, a martial career in gladiator school. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag because some people also wanted the career because it's relatively like being a pop star. <laughs> like you've got cheering crowds, you've adoring movies, <laughs> things like that. But yeah, it's also a dangerous and bloody business. And uh, now we've relatively civilized it. We have soccer matches and we've got hooligans <laughs> also beating up each other. You have boxing, you have judo competitions, fencing competitions, things like this. Um, so this tradition in a way still exists in our modern society. Um, but it's become a lot less, well, bloody and a lot more uh, yeah, organized and in a way there's advantages and disadvantages to that um, because on the one hand certain the forbidding of certain moves they're in a way also necessary to keep people alive and not ending them up in hospital so in generally with karate competitions there's also certain kicks or certain clamps which are forbidden because you don't want to accidentally break somebody's neck or uh, do things like that but in the same way also the gladiators had certain rules they basically wouldn't do because, well, it doesn't look good and it ends the fight too quickly. But uh, also in gladiatorial combat there was a lot of freedom. So a lot of different schools uh, developed. So often a teacher would have like the, his own little stable, he would have like <laughs> ten gladiators and there would be yeah, other gladiator, gladiatorial schools. And yeah, people from different schools of fighting, different schools of philosophy, of on fighting, would also compete. Um, so it's very similar in a way to the, uh, to the oriental system where you have also different teachers, each has their own dojo with the own master, the own sensei, who yeah, in a way forms a tradition which the students follow and then the students can follow in the same tradition or found new traditions. So in a way, Roman, uh, yeah, the Roman system of gladiatorial combat was very similar to the uh, yeah, Oriental system. <coughs> there have also been some gladiatorial revolts, quite a few, and they've generally been quite unsuccessful because gladiators are quite good at fighting one to one, but it's very different to fight in military formation and to cooperate like that. Um, so the gladiators. Although they do well in guerrilla actions in those wars, they did very poorly against organized armies. Um, what they did have a lot was fear on their side, because everybody feared gladiators. Um, so even if there was a gladiatorial rebellion, then people generally fled the area and also armies were relatively reluctant to fight against them, even though they were usually quite successful in, in doing so. <coughs> Um, it's also very much about the, the, the principle. Uh, if you're fighting in a formation, you're just there trying to yeah, catch blows, protect the people next to you, and you look for the easy targets, the easy kill. And in a way, by how the gladiators trained, they've actually trained themselves not to look for the easy kill, not to look for the easy target, because then, well, the match is over. <laughs> That's also a little bit the conditioning which even though you know a lot about fighting, you build up certain habits which are not that useful in, uh, in war. Um, you see also that um, 
as a more or less side spectacle to the gladiatorial combat. Uh, arenas were used also for, uh, yeah, for plays, but here they have both an arena and an amphitheater. And so here it's quite separate. So you will feel that like the, the solar <coughs> impulse is very present at the amphitheater, which is very much about beauty, about art, and here you have much more the Mars impulse. Well, if you, for instance, go to the Colosseum in Rome, there they have like lots of different spectacles and gladiatorial games, so there the energies are also quite mixed and unclear. Um, the other thing which uh, Jessica noted is also the fear. Um, because the arena was also the place of punishment. So if, for instance, a person would steal or murder or do commit some other crime, uh, well, locking a person up is basically an expensive business. You need a jail, you need a guard. Uh, well, they didn't give food to the prisoners. They usually left that to the families. And if the person had no family or friends to give them food, the person would just starve in prison. So pretty much like the Middle Ages. But rather than put the person in prison, which is rather useless, or, uh, they would uh, toss them into the arena and have them uh, fight the gladiator. And this was often also uh, kind of a Gottesgericht, uh, a divine judgment. Because if the criminal could kill the gladiator, he would be a free man. So this was also when, uh, how in a way guilt was decided or how law was decided. If the person was caught, uh, well, he could claim he's guilty or not. Well, if he is truly innocent, well, then he will defeat the gladiator and he will be a free man. So let's not worry too much about it. <laughs> the gods can decide. <laughs> um, so this was also a place of justice. Um, what I would like to do is to, uh, to focus a little bit on the the different uh, powers which are here, the different spirits which are here. Um, so there's a very strong Mars impulse, which is really teaching people the discipline of combat, how to focus yourself, how to discipline yourself, how to work with that. Um, you also have the Eros energy and the Venus energy, because it's also about sensitivity, about intuition, knowing what to do, feeling what to do, having the inspiration uh, of the gods. So this is the Venus impulse, which can be felt here. And uh, there's also yeah, spirits of, of knowledge, spirits of wisdom, spirits of justice. But they're a little bit more to the background. So but at least all of them can be found here. So I think that would be uh, interesting to, um, to try to do that. So we'll start with the Mars impulse, because this is the, the strongest impulse here. So the Mars impulse is very much about strengthening the body. So a good way to feel the Mars impulse is in a way to use your breath. When you uh, breathe in, you tense your body. And then you relax. And you really grab the energy. Build it up and relax yourself. 